So what I'm talking about now is really the exhibition that we have upstairs. It's our visual magic, Dolly's masterworks, and augmented reality. And there's a question, why are we doing this show? Why did we take all of our paintings which had salons made for them and move them over to our other gallery? Well, there's two reasons. The first is nostalgia. For any of you who went to the old Dolly Museum on the other side, we had a lower area that was called the lower gallery. You can see it here in the photo. And you could see four of the largest works all in one sweep. And then behind you, we had the other three to four, depending on when you visited. There was an opportunity to see these kind of pieces and with the kind of impact that Dolly had intended. We lost that when we moved into this building. What we gained was these really intimate, beautiful salons that had natural lighting. But we've always wanted to see one more time what that was like because people remembered it so well. So that's what we have upstairs. So inspired by nostalgia. And then the second thing, of course, is the Dolly Museum is very interested in technology, seeing how technology can change our presentations. So with this, we were able to explore augmented reality, something we had not done before. Um, we have upstairs our virtual reality experience where you can actually, with headphones and goggles, you can actually see the inside of um, the archeological reminiscence painting, see it reimagined and explore it on your own. We also have added this wonderful feature of uh, Dolly Lives, which is artificial intelligence. And if, you're, if you haven't experienced it yet, the, the screen you want to go to is the one that's on the third floor, the one that's right outside of the galleries. There are many comments by Dolly about his works that are very much, all the comments that he says come right out of his own writings or things that he said in interviews. So what he's sharing with you is actually exactly what he said at the time. So that's an interesting experience if you haven't had that yet. And now we've added the augmented reality. And I'm sure most of you have had a chance to do this, but if you haven't, you just need to download our new app. And you, can, you don't have to be in the gallery to experience it. You can go to any image of the paintings that I'm gonna be talking about today, use the app, and it will start the movie, basically the short uh, visual experience of these paintings. So it's a lot of fun. You just hold your camera up to the image, get the image in there, and it starts the movie. Um, people have been loving it. It's been very interesting going into the gallery and having such hushed tones as people are exploring these movies and exploring the in-depth experience. That's not what I'm going to offer you to you today. What I'm going to do is a bit of a deep dive on these eight paintings, sharing with you a lot, too much, about all of them, but I'm going to do it relatively quickly. So the first question is this term, masterwork. What is this all about? Why do we refer to these eight paintings as the Dolly Masterworks? And the big question that you know, it brings up is, isn't this a masterwork? You know, what is the difference between these large canvases and the paintings that we consider to be the most important from Dolly's career? Uh, this is indeed a masterwork, a masterpiece, a masterwork. The concept that we have for that term, certainly it can be associated with any painting by Dolly that's great. Anything that's like a soft construction with boiled beans or some of the paintings of the Tate Gallery or MoMA, these are the core works that we associate with Dolly totally appropriate to use the term masterwork. But that's a different use than what we're intending or what we're using here. So during Dolly's surrealist time, he explored through a process, through about 60 paintings, the extreme small exquisite works that he was doing, very much like his portrait of his wife. Tiny, tiny works that are 10 to five inches tall that are exquisite miniatures. He did this for about 10 years and did some really just extraordinary um, uh, work during this time. Some of his very finest work was done in the 30s on this very tiny diminished scale. But when Dolly returned to Spain in 1948, after he had been in exile in the US, he started a process that was very much the opposite of that. He started painting what you could call monumental or maximal paintings. He started to go to the other extreme. Large canvases suddenly seemed to be the appropriate voice, the appropriate medium that he wanted to use to talk about his new ideas. Um, and what he was doing is he was referencing two very different traditions, or related but distant in time. The first is in the 19th century. Some of the, the most important paintings coming out of uh, France were done on this monumental scale. Huge canvases, 17, 20 feet uh, long. Canvases that were to make a huge impact and basically make artists' careers. They were the paintings that were put in competitions. They were to be judged by the government, and they'd be hopefully purchased by the government so that your career would be made and you would be in a public space. In the 20th century, that idea of scale came back again with the abstract expressionists. 
they realize the power and impact of canvas, monumentality, the kind of the, the sublime could be communicated much more directly through something that was overwhelming and all empowering. So during the time that Dolly's moving past surrealism, he's spending time in America in the mid 1940s, and by the end of the time when he's ready to return back to Spain, American abstract expressionism really starts to take root. People like Pollock, Rothko, um, uh, and others <laughs> just went completely blank there. Um, but they started to explore the idea of abstract expressionism where they would use large canvases and they would paint work that was not about representational imagery. Following the, the dropping of the bomb, representational imagery really had disappeared from the language of most artists in America and that set the tone for international artists. Of course, Dolly being a very different and contrary artist, went in the opposite direction and started to create monumental pain paintings that were about maximal content. So Reynolds Morse, somewhere around the 1970s, around the time of the opening of the original museum in Beechwood, convinced Dolly that there was something really special about these paintings, that these paintings needed to have a categorization of their own. Just like the miniatures have been, you know, assumed to be a body of work, for Reynolds Morse, he felt that Dolly's large canvases also needed to be distinguished. And that's where the term Dolly masterwork comes from. It's Ronald Morse's um, use of a term that should be applied to a lot of different things, but for him it applied to this particular category of paintings. And he came up with two very, very broad categories. Each of these paintings had to measure at least five feet in one or both dimensions. Five feet is not a monumental painting, but it's a big painting. And then, of course, it goes from anywhere from five to about 13 feet in length or width. And then the second thing is these had to basically Occupy Dolly for a period of about a year. You know, these were the obsession of that year. That's basically the way that these were perceived. And between 1948 and 70, Dolly produced anywhere from 18 to 22 of these large canvases. And the reason that number is very broad is because Reynolds Morris found certain paintings to be key and then certain large paintings not to be as important if they were done in the same year. So there's really 22 large canvases. Some are more realized than others. And Reynolds Morris, you know, kind of split hair, so to speak. So you could arguably say there's 22 of these, but we always refer to them as the 18 masterworks. And in order to accomplish this, when Dolly returned to Spain, he realized he was nuts. He realized as an artist, he had great skill, but he did not have the ability to take on these large canvases by himself. This was more than he had really bargained for. And so he took on one major studio assistant who stayed with him for the next two decades, a man named Isidro Bea. And Bea's background was doing theater backdrops for large um, performances in Barcelona. He had the skill to quickly paint large signs and things like that. He was a perfect person to work with Dali. Um, Dali also had potentially other assistants. The one that we know of is the, the American Tim Phillips, who when he was young, actually for about a two year period, lived on Dolly's grounds and would help him in a variety of ways. And that was around the time that Dolly painted the um, uh, St. John of the Cross. So Dolly did not work by himself. He did work with others. And Bea did a lot of painting. He did a lot of things always to Dolly's determination. Dolly was the theatrical director. He was the person who painted the large areas and then Dolly would come and do the details. He would do the physical forms, all the things that he did best. But he would think about this and prepare over the course of the entire year. And so paintings would take different lengths of time. Um, the Columbus painting took six months. The Toreador took 16 months. So there's long periods of time that these gestate before they're finished. <coughs> The other thing Dolly did is he hired an assistant and he cut a slit into a studio floor. Dolly did not want to work on scaffolding. He didn't want to work on ladders and to work on this kind of scale, you would have to do something in order to make that work. So Dolly had the ingenious idea, let's create something where I can raise and lower the canvas. I can work on it very directly. And every time you see Dolly, he's seated in front of the canvas. So he would lower it to where he wanted it to be and he'd work on the fine detail. <coughs> Dolly would also work with uh, photos when he was doing these works. He would tape the photos up, copy them, transfer them, and then do the detail that way. So very much working like a photo realist. Which brings us to the talk, the eight masterworks. And as I said, 
lot of slides, but I'm going to go relatively quickly to get through them, <coughs> if my cold lets me. Uh, so we have eight of them upstairs from 1956 to 1976, so a good 20-year period covered. And the first one we're going to start with is Nature Mort Vivant, Still Life, Fast Moving. This is going to be rough. Okay. So, 1956, this was painted, painted over probably a five-month period. It was first shown at the Carstairs Gallery, <coughs> along with another body of work. And that's the other thing just to mention is that when Dolly would do these works, he would also be doing a small group of paintings anywhere from five to 15, and they would be shown at the same exhibition. So a variety of more typical works, much like the works we have upstairs, would supplement the show, but then each one of these was the focus of the show. And this became like a pattern. Almost every fall, somewhere around um, November or December, Dolly would have a New York show. He'd be working on it all summer long, bring the works to New York, and then show it at Carstairs or Nodler Gallery. So this was first shown at Carstairs. And the chief inspiration for it, in some ways, is Dolly's uh, you know, a opportunity to see a photograph by Harold Edgerton. And I'm sure you've all seen this before. This was done in 1934. It was done with a highly revolutionary process of having a camera that could take an incredibly quick photo that the eye of something the eye could not witness. So this is essentially, it's milk. It's a drop of milk being dropped in. And it creates this astounding sort of physical property. Dolly was so excited by this that it really started his imagination about what you could do with that idea of high speed and at the same time precision where you could stop it in, in motion. And the theme and source for the work, which relates to this, is the idea of Heisenberg and physics. So Dolly started to get really excited by the science behind the atomic bomb, the science of the subatomic level, the way that um, particles, electrons, and protons are kept in a kind of rapid succession of um, like a dance in space, that solid objects are made of more space than they are objects. And so he describes the painting very clearly here in a very curious way. He says, this is an explanatory painting where one can observe the dynamic and irrational dividing of a fruit dish following the coefficients of the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg in opposition to the positive security which Cubist paintings once offered us. Never mind that last part. The main thing he's saying is that he has an idea that he wants to communicate through a metaphor. And it's, he's using one particular fruit dish and showing it in two different ways. So we'll come right back to that in a moment. The painting that Dolly uses to essentially animate or inspire this, uh, this presentation is a painting that's in a private collection by Floris von Schutten, a uh, Dutch painter called Table with Food. This would be a traditional painting of traditional still life, opulent, full of a lot of material. But you can see the pattern that Dolly borrows is that white cloth with the red, um, the red starred tablecloth. And then some of the fruit winds up coming over into Dolly's work. Which brings us right back to Heisenberg. And for the longest time during surrealism, Dolly's major in influence was uh, Sigmund Freud and the idea of psychoanalysis and the interpretation of dreams. In the 1950s, late 40s, early 50s, Dolly replaces psychoanalysis with physics, quantum physics. He starts getting really excited by things he's learning about uh, the subatomic universe. And in particular, this is the one concept that I think blew Dolly's mind and felt the closest to surrealism a kind of a rational understanding of the world. Quantum physics revealed that on a subatomic level, we can either locate the position of, an, of a particle or its velocity, but we can't know the velocity of a particle and its position simultaneously. In our daily world, we all, you know, just going to a baseball game, it's the best metaphor. You know the speed of a baseball at any point during its trajectory. On a subatomic level, that's impossible. And this is just such a mind-blowing concept that this is what Dolly decided he was going to try to create a metaphor of. And so what we have is perfectly illustrated with this apple. This is one apple seen in two different ways. One apple casts a shadow over a fruit dish. That's a location or a position of an atomic particle. And the other one that seems very phallic, I think very deliberately looks very phallic, is actually the, a the apple being thrown through space at a trajectory, but it has no location. So it's speed or velocity and then location or position. So he's creating this visual metaphor in this very sort of complicated way. 
He also is drawing on mathematics. So these paintings start to have a really tight relationship with mathematics. And Dolly had met a gentleman named Attila Gika, who was a mathematician who was obsessed with the golden ratio, golden proportion, perfect harmonious proportion that's been used all the way back to Greek and Roman times. This is a particular um, rectangle that came from one of Matilla Gika's books. And Dolly was looking at it, and he turned it on its side, and this became the structural composition that he drew upon when he painted this work. So this was actually, the Morrises actually own a canvas exactly the same size as uh, Nature More Vivant, and it's just this pattern. So then when you see the painting, this is the same proportion, and finally when we overlay it, you can see how so much of the painting is very deliberately and meticulously um, oriented. So for example, the knife flows that way, the interior side of the, um, the building is defined by this one line, the tabletop is up here. All of these key moments in the painting correspond with this, uh, this design, this graph that uh, Dolly was relying on. And we'll see that again with some of the other paintings. You know, and these are also the first paintings that influenced the uh, photorealists of the next decade. So this is 1956, photorealism really comes into power in the 1960s, but you can see that Dolly is obsessed by almost the same type of realism they are. So the other thing that Dolly brings into this, so we have mathematics, we have science, we have a visual metaphor inspired by Edgerton, and the final thing is that Dolly is obsessed at this time by spirals in nature. And it seems that what Dolly's trying to do is convince himself of a cosmic force out there, some sort of godlike presence, you know, intelligent design, whatever you want to call it, and he's trying to find examples in nature that reinforce that. And so what he starts doing is he becomes obsessed by the golden uh, spiral and also by the Fibonacci sequence, which is this kind of perfect mathematical order that can be found in many examples through nature. So for example, there's the cauliflower. It looks like broccoli, but it is cauliflower. Dolly's very specific about that. Um, but you can see there's a variety of different spirals all through it. You know, and they, they go in this direction, and then they go, so they're like that, but they're also like this. And they radiate out from the center. So it's a proportional growth. You know, it's what you find in, in plants. Dolly uses that as, a, as an example to show perfect order in nature. I think he's also using it because not just does it have the spiral formation, but it also seems to suggest the atomic mushroom cloud. I think he's deliberately thinking of those two things because that's the world that he's reacting to as he explores these, uh, these ideas in the paintings. There are also rhino horns, and there's a rhino horn being held by this gentleman over on the far corner, dirty fingernails and all. I think that's one of the real classic touches of Dolly. And the idea here is that you'll see rhinos through rhino horns through a lot of Dolly's paintings at this time. They seem very erotic, and that's certainly deliberate, but also they have these perfect logarithmic spirals just like an ear, like a nautilus shell. So it's another reference, just like the cauliflower, to natural spirals. And then the other exciting thing about this painting, it was painted in 1953. This was the year that Watson and Crick introduced the concept that the DNA molecule had a double helix form to it. And Dolly actually references that in his painting, which is pretty remarkable. Nobody in the world of art was referencing this particular discovery at this time. So almost at the moment that they come out and they say the, the DNA molecule has this double helix spiral shape to it, Dolly paints a double helix spiral on the banister of the, uh, out in the um, outside area of the building. And the last detail to share with you, and then we'll move on, is Picasso and gravity. So there's this really beautiful bottle of anise that Dolly, or, um, Dolly has painted very much a photorealist sort of wonderment of, uh, of exactitude, trying to paint as beautifully as possible. But he's referring to, what he's referring to is Pablo Picasso's collage, The Bottle of Anise. And he's trying to suggest that the world of modernism from just 20 to 30 years earlier was based on an idea of, um, of, of physics that no longer applied. The concept of gravity of that period that it was associated with was a world that was left behind, that Dolly was moving in a different direction. So you could easily call these works sci-fi works, too. I think there's a lot of science fiction and fantasy that Dolly's bringing to the fore. And you could also say it's a dream of science, because I think all these paintings are very much dreamlike, but they're drawing on science instead of psychology as the source. 
So we spent a lot of time there. I think we can go a little quicker with some of these other ones. Velasquez is a wonderful painting though, because so in the painting we just saw, that's about atomic energy and atomic science. The painting about the Infanta Margarita brings that together with the world of Spanish culture. So Dali is also in these paintings exploring his own identity as a Spaniard and as a Catalan. And so this is the next painting we have, Velasquez painted in 1958. Velasquez painting the Infanta Margarita with the lights and shadows of his own glory. Great title. And it was first presented in uh, Carstairs in the following year, 1958 to 59, along with some other paintings that are familiar, including two works that are considered to be masterworks. So here we have a year where Dolly did three masterworks instead of one, and they all somehow are okay. But I just wanted to mention that. Not gonna worry about that, but it's very important to us to know that Eleanor Morse loved this painting more than any in the collection. So when they bought this painting, you know, they actually had to build a wing onto their house to properly show it. So that's what you do when you buy Dolly paintings. You build wings onto your houses. <coughs> So I mentioned that Dali is focusing on this painting about Spain. So this is the 300th anniversary of the passing of Velazquez. Very important moment for Spanish, um, Spanish art. Uh, this is one of the great paintings, the Las Meninas, which features the young Infanta uh, surrounded by her, uh, her assistants, the, the women in waiting, the maids in waiting. This is the amazing painting that has Velazquez painting himself in rather than signing his own canvas. It also has the king and queen reflected in the mirror. It's a very much studied and much commented on painting that influenced every Spanish artist and most modern artists. And of course, Picasso did a very deep dive around the same period of time. If you have a chance to see the Picasso Museum in Barcelona, there's at least 30 paintings inspired by this particular painting, the Las Meninas. And they're remarkable, they're strange, they're just full of invention and they lead in a very different direction than Dali's painting. So this is what Picasso was doing to um, react to the 300th uh, anniversary. Dali looks at the next painting in the series, the Infanta Margarita, which was a painting of the slightly older uh, Infanta. And this was a painting that would have been shipped to different kingdoms in order to find a suitor for her. So it was essentially, you know, she's of marriageable age. We want to bring our court, our, you know, kingdoms together, this is what it was painted for. And it's a really remarkable painting. And the thing that, that's known about Velazquez is that his brush stroke has a very loose quality to it. He didn't have a lot of time to paint. He had to paint quickly. So he developed a very loose brush stroke that later inspired the Impressionists. And it was very quick and rapid and yet very successful as a Baroque painting style. Dali then paints in his work a silhouette of Velasquez actually painting this canvas. And I don't know if you can see it, but it's right here. We're seeing it from the side. So you may not have noticed that detail, but it's really important. You can see her hand probably most prominently and then her face. So the hand is right over here and her face is up here. And he's in a long hallway, which has a lot of storm-like activity going on. And the space itself of that hallway references another painting. This is the Allegory of Sight and Smell. It's a painting that's owned by the Prado, so Dolly saw it when he was a student there. And he's using it for the drama of this particular hallway back here. <coughs> so if you see it up close, this is the detail from our painting, which is definitely a recreation of that detail from this painting. And this was um, the Duke and the, the Archduke and the Archduchess of Asturia, who were living in the Netherlands, painted this of their collection, which eventually wound up in Madrid. So it's, it's all going back to Madrid as a Spanish connection. And then we come to the amazing connection that Dali makes that nobody else probably would have ever arrived at, which is that the brushstroke of Velasquez reminded Dali of photos he had seen in Scientific American of the fate of antimatter. So what is that all about? Well, here we see the brushstroke of Velasquez, and especially right in here you can see how quickly and loosely that's put together, you know, to create that sense of volume and scale. It's, it's very much the opposite of Vermeer. You know, Vermeer is also very painterly, but there's a very exacting quality to Vermeer. Velasquez creates the same sort of sensation, the same sensuality, but much more rapidly. And Dali started to look at these photos from Scientific American, and it's like, that looks like Velasquez. 
or maybe Velasquez looks like those photos. Whichever connection, it's extraordinary. And it allows Dolly to do something that no artist would have been poised to do at that point, which is bringing these two worlds together. So here's another photograph of the annihilation of antimatter. And you can see this kind of the atomic source of Dolly's obsession here. This is the brooch of the Infanta. And the idea is that the colored Infanta that fills up and occupies the canvas is the explosion of atomic particles that are swirling together or imploding to create the secondary image of her. So we have Velasquez painting the work and simultaneously there's this implosion of particles that create the much more vivid Infanta. So nuclear particles and abstract expressionism this is Dolly's hand of the Infanta holding the rose. And you can see the sort of extraordinary calligraphy that Dolly uses. It's not like Velasquez's, but it's certainly not like the painting we just saw a moment ago, you know, like the way the um, knife had been painted so accurately. This is much more loose and seems to be inspired by the people that Dolly is reacting against. People like Mark uh, Toby, who had this incredible sort of geography to his brushstroke as an abstract expressionist. There's a calligraphy to it that seems very close to Dali's. And here you can see them together. You can see particularly the patterns right here, the way that they seem to match with Toby. So it's like he's taking abstract expressionism and, and making it work for representational imagery, which is a pretty amazing thing. Here you have Velasquez and Dali. One last detail, which is the Fibonacci rhino horn. We've got those once again. So we had rhino, a rhino horn being held in the last painting. Here we got a bunch of rhino horns all coming in and imploding in her head, which again has that, um, that spiral, that sense of energy, and also the perfect spiral or the logarithmic spiral. And then my favorite part of all is the publicity shot. So Dolly was so proud of having done this, he got to bring his painting to the Prado. <laughs> and it's just the best. It's my favorite photo of all of Dolly's photos. It's like, you, do not miss the legacy that I'm a part of. Do not miss how I have updated uh, the important statement of Alaska's. So, you know, he's very consciously using these also as a kind of propaganda device, you know, placing Dolly very central to Spanish history. Third painting we're going <coughs> to, excuse me. <coughs> Third painting we're talking about is The Discovery of America by Christopher Columbus, which has way too much stuff going on with it, but we can quickly get to the essence of it. It's a busy painting. The painting he had painted just the prior year, Santiago El Grande, very simple, a rising horse in a complicated space. Here, it's like everything is included, every detail Dolly thought of. And it was first shown at the Huntington Hartford Collection, it was sold before it got shown, so it wasn't seen until 1964 in a Huntington Hartford studio. It's also the largest painting Dolly created. It's 13 feet tall. So it's a pretty remarkable moment in Dolly's career that he paints this. And it's a history painting imagined as a dream. And you could almost say that every one of these large canvases has a dreamlike quality to it. But this one in particular, we have the alternative title, which was originally The Dream of Columbus, which seemed much more accurate in some ways. And this is why Columbus looks like this sort of Greek youth walking out of the, uh, you know, in a toga, coming out of the sea. It's a dream, it's a reimagining. There's nothing historically accurate. It's Dali reinterpreting in the same way he did with Nature Bird Vivant, reinterpreting metaphorically. And the other thing that's really important is Dali identified with Columbus. And we'll see why in a minute, but primarily Columbus comes through the new world, rediscovers, you know, discovers the new world and is celebrated for that. Dali comes to America himself in the 1940s, is embraced by America and is reborn. And so there's a real identity that he shares with Columbus. The composition, just like we saw on um, Nature More Vivant, is mathematical. <coughs> this is uh, the golden spiral superimposed on top of it. It's been pointed out you can place the golden spiral in several different places and it still works, but it's almost the idea that Gala is the source of the spiral, comes out of her face, goes off the canvas, and comes back in explaining that kind of curious ear shape of the composition that it tends to swing this way. And that's actually the source. So unlike a pyramid structure, which we saw before, this moves in a different direction. It's also been pointed out by Stephen Kenny uh, in an interesting way that the light source seems to be Gala. It does not seem to be the orb above them. So she is definitely central to the way that he's presented this. All the shadows seem to emanate from her. 
And the really important detail for Dali is that we think of Columbus as being Italian. When Dali painted this, there was an argument against that. There was an argument that Columbus was actually Catalan. And for Dali, this suddenly becomes not just national heritage, but local Catalan heritage. And so the idea, which if you go to Barcelona, you will see this right at the port, it's Columbus in Barcelona pointing to the New World. Um, you know, he met with the King and Queen of Spain in Barcelona. But um, there's this argument that he has this Catalan heritage, and it's, uh, it's revealed in, um, by this particular author, Dr. Luis Ulloa, who in 1927, so quite a bit earlier, had proposed for a number of reasons that he was Catalan, primarily based on, um, on linguistic evidence, that he always wrote in Catalan, he was met in Barcelona, and um, let's see, his writings, he gave many of his discoveries in the New World, Catalan names. So for Dali, this becomes really like the, what is it, the secret sauce. This is why this is so exciting. He's not just a, a discoverer of New Worlds, he's a Catalan discoverer of New Worlds. So for Dali, super important. So just to go through who all these figures are, what's going on, at the very top of the canvas, we have Michelangelo's Pieta, Michelangelo's Moses, and we have the King and Queen of Spain meeting with Columbus prior to the voyage. So all of this is sanctioned by this kind of uh, spiritual and secular power. Also, Dolly has two ways of seeing his wife. One is remarkably as the Immaculate Conception, which if you know anything about Gala, not really the way we would normally think about her. She was a very active, immaculate person. Um, but uh, he also identifies her with St. Helena, as he paints her several times, identified with the true cross. So the inspiration for the voyage, she's the one who's bringing him in a Spanish way to the New World. And actually her, um, the pole that supports the banner on which she's is, is actually in the ground before Columbus has set foot. So she's the one leading the voyage. And then we have the um, references to Spain, both in the lances and the crucifixion. So the lances that are in the upper left hand, upper right hand side of the canvas and the halberds are a reference to Velazquez again. So Velazquez is still very much on Dolly's mind. It's the surrender of Breda, and you can see those halberds and the lances that Dolly uh, uses. But then of course on the upper right hand side, those lances also form a kind of grid on which we can see another important Spanish image that Dolly had painted, which is St. John of the Cross. And the Christ of St. John of the Cross painting from a little bit earlier was inspired by the Spanish mystic. So we have Velasquez and we have St. John of the Cross, Spanish mystic. Lots of Spanish culture Dolly's trying to work into here. And then just to make the point clear, he paints himself holding that image. There's also a Catalan inspiration, and this is a really nice sort of complement to the Spanish themes. And that's in this city of Girona, which is the capital of Catalonia. There's a particular uh, bishop who in the 300s, like 302 AD, he was murdered in the middle of a service in the church. He was thus buried into the church of St. Felix in a tomb. And then there's a folk legend. And the folk legend is really important to the Catalan people. It said that on three occasions, as the French tried to come over the Pyrenees, this tomb would open up and swarms of flies would come out and they would drive back the invaders. And so this is still celebrated to this day. This is the, the, the um, tapestry on the outside of his tomb. And you can see all these black dots. Those are the flies driving back these French uh, on horseback. And it's celebrated to this day as the miracle of the flies, San Narciso and the flies. There's a festival every year. It's a very deep old Catholic festival. There are actually pastries made in the shape of flies. <laughs> it is a very important and probably the the origin of some of these ideas is long lost, but it's a tradition that they still celebrate. So this is very important to Dali. And so he brings this into the canvas. And here we have Dali with a fly on his mustache. And you can see the transformation of the flies in the middle of his body. So there's this identity with flies as being about freedom and being about Catalonia, which brings a nice contrast to Velasquez and St. John. Gala has two roles in the painting. She's both the muse and in Dolly's public life, she also wanted to stay out of the circus that his life had become, the media frenzy. And that's the second figure we see over here on the far right. Last but not least, the Sputnik sea urchin. There is a weird orb at the bottom of the canvas that was the last thing Dolly added. <coughs> it looks a little bit like a landmine or maybe a mine that's outside in a harbor, but it has these celestial orbs around it. It's a sea urchin. 
And back when Dolly's father kicked him out of his family house, he shaved his head and put a sea urchin on his head. The reason he did that was a reference to the fact that Dolly's father loved eating sea urchins. Dolly saw himself as the son of a man who wanted to destroy him. And the idea was a reference to William Tell, that just like William Tell's son put the apple on his head, Dolly puts his father's favorite food on his head. He's trying to survive by distracting his father, eat the food, not me. And you know, that's, that's the gist of it. But it goes back to 1929. So here we are, 1959. Dolly paints it again, but there's something more celestial about it. And the main thing that's really, I think, really pertinent is the year before this was created, Sputnik 1 was launched by the Russians, the first unmanned satellite successfully launched into space. This had a lot of power and a lot of impact. Dolly was of the generation that grew up on Jules Verne. The excitement of fantasy, of adventure, travel, space was obviously on everybody's mind. The particular sea urchin that Dolly has painted is known as the Sputnik Sea Urchin. That's the name of it. So it's a very deliberate reference to this particular uh, satellite. It means fellow traveler in Russian. And the final thing is that just like he's stepping onto the new world, very soon we were traveling in outer space, stepping onto new worlds as well. So there's a sign of very clear idea of the space race has started. Dolly's thinking about adventure, thinking about discovery, thinking about what's going to come in the future. And so this definitely is in tune with the moment as well as paying homage to Spain. And a publicity shot, lovely publicity shot. There's, you will never see a photo of Dolly working on one of these canvases. There's only one group of photos of tuna fishing. Every other photo, the painting's done, and he's there with the brush, you know, just the last, last uh, step of, to the painting. Ecumenical Council is a little bit quicker and easier because it's relatively straightforward. It's filled with a lot of material again. It's not as sensational as what we just saw, but it, it totally works with it. First shown at Carstairs Gallery in 1961. And Dolly's plan for it, he said, this is great. In this exhibit, the one at Carstairs, I'm showing a unique picture. My latest work, the Ecumenical Council, which I consider the greatest historical event of our time, and which prudently I have painted before it has met. <laughs> the Pope had announced that he was going to call the Ecumenical Council, so Dolly has painted a dream of what that council moment will be like. And it becomes a little complicated, which is uh, not surprising, but it's, it's pretty interesting. So the composition, first off, mathematics. Dolly goes back to his friend, Matila Gika. He's looking at one of these grids related to a Grecian urn, and he gets the idea, what if that was turned upside down, and that becomes the pyramid structure for our composition, you know, focusing basically on the cross that's in the middle and then spiraling out in different sections. It also separates the spiritual from the secular portions of the canvas. It's also been pointed out in a lecture last year uh, that this looks much more like an Annunciation than an um, actual Trinity painting. And what I mean by that is there's a painting that's in the, um, the Vatican. It was by Dolly. It was a study for this. And it has two titles. It's both called the Trinity and the Annunciation. And that's a little bit strange, because those are very different concepts. This is an El Greco painting of the Trinity. And you can see God the Father with the dove, the Holy Spirit above him, and Christ on his lap, almost a bit of a Pieta kind of composition. This is an Annunciation where you have God the Father, the angel Gabriel, the uh, Virgin Mary, and the dove right above her. This looks much more like what Dolly has painted than the trinity of uh, El Greco. And so what we think is that Dolly just made it work. You know, He used one idea and changed it into something else. He also says he's painting the, the ecumenical council itself, which hasn't happened. But then he also says it's a coronation of the pope, which happened in 1958. So whether this is a coronation or the ecumenical council that's about to happen, there are three simultaneous views. So it's almost like we're seeing the view from God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost simultaneously superimposed like a collage. And then to make it one step more complicated, he uses an octopus, dips it in paint, smacks it against the top of the canvas, and uses that random pattern to project another uh, another vision of either the coronation or the council itself. But you can see, the longer you look at it, you start to see the miters, like right here, and uh, no, right there, and you see the figures, and then there's other figures that Dolly's able to pull out of that abstraction. 
So he's using lots of methods. It's not just photorealism that he's using. The Trinity, God the Father, we're not to look upon his face. And Dolly places him in St. Peter's Basilica. So this particular design that Dolly has here is definitely the basilica. It was mentioned that that was painted completely by Isidro Bea. So if you're wondering what kinds of things Bea was able to do, he painted the architectural details completely by himself. Dolly's also drawing on history. And there's a, a book that should be coming out within the next year or two by um, a Dr. Uh, Boats, is Boats, about uh, Dolly and the Old Masters. And one of the things he points out is the similarity here between Michelangelo's Last Judgment and also Haman is denounced from the Sistine ceiling with the way Dolly has depicted God the Father. Here we have God the Son or Christ with his kind of energy robes, so sort of like the Infanta's robes. And finally, the Holy Spirit is both dove and person. And then we move down a little bit. We see Gala as both Saint Helena, once again associated with the true cross, as well as Moses. Her pose is someone inspired by Michelangelo's Moses. So she seems to be Dolly's inspiration. She's also the one who's the transition between him, the mortal, and the spiritual world above him. So she's coming down for inspiration. Dolly presents himself as one more tribute to Velasquez. Just like Velasquez painted himself into Las Meninas without signing it, Dolly paints himself into his canvas with the blank canvas in front of him. And then one publicity shot. Here we have Dolly, finished canvas, but looking very excitedly, working on that last detail that was missing. And then we move into the very long title. Galaxy, Dolacy, Desoxy, Ribonucleic Acid. Lots and lots of letters in this one. Uh, Painted in 1963, first shown at the Nodler Gallery. And Dolly was really proud because it was the longest title. <laughs> he said, he was just so proud. He said, at the time when titles are short, like picture number one, I title my homage to Crick and Watson, Galaxy Dolacy Des Oxy Ribonucleic Acid. It is the longest title in one word. <laughs> he was very proud of that. But the theme is even longer. It's as long as the genetic persistence of human memory. You know, so Dolly never went lightly when he could talk about his works, you know. He definitely made sure that we knew their importance. And what does that, mean, that title mean? What is all of that, that, all those syllables, you know, what are they about? Well, it's both a reference to himself and his wife. So Dolly and Gala become part of the kind of word game he's listening to. So Gala and Dolly is like Gala see, Dolly see. Allah, which is the God, Arabic god, or the word for Lord, and El Cid, the hero of Spanish uh, you know, chivalry, are combined with the al Cid, And then finally, the DNA molecule. So it's kind of straightforward, but it still seems complicated when you, uh, you, know, when you hear it. And Dolly says that um, it's basically, it is a decade later coming back to Crick and Watson. We saw the, the banister in the first painting, Nature More Vivant. Now, both of them, Crick and Watson, for their discovery of the double helix shape, received a Nobel Prize. So 1963, Nobel Prize to the two of them. Dolly creates the whole show around this painting. And this is the catalog where he has both Watson and Crick uh, celebrated. And the thing that's interesting about the painting is it's a cycle painting of life, death, and rebirth. So it's more traditional. It goes back to um, kind of medieval times. And in the inspiration for it, or the reason it was painted, was because there was a flood. In Barcelona in 1962, the river called the Rio Lobregat uh, flooded. 450 people were found dead. Another 400, 300 went missing. So an incredible tragedy, just a massive number of people dead and missing. Dolly painted a work called uh, Christ of the Veils to raise money for them, but he also painted this work to offer a sense of solace. And right in the very center of it, it's easy to miss, but this is the Rio Lobregat flooded. So it's the reference to what the painting is about. It begins with the sense that Christ is dead, something you may not see right away. But in this particular composition, right at the bottom, forming an arch around his wife Gala, is Christ. And when we get up close, the reason it's hard to see is because his head is upside down. It's very much like a Greek sculpture. And we're looking at the top of his head. His eyes are below. His lips and nose are above. They're right underneath the, uh, the, the river that's flooded. So Christ has been crucified. He's been buried in the cave. And it's the moment where he's being brought out of the cave, brought back to heaven, given life to come back to earth. So that's the concept. 
going back to Catholic themes. You can see the wound in the side of his, uh, his, um, in his side. It is the wrong side. Dolly said it worked. So that's why he uh, painted it there. You know, it's like convenient, uh, but he didn't want to leave out one of those symbols. He also said that his wife's hair was to represent um, bread, the Eucharist. So the bread, of, um, the bread of life from the Catholic Church. The DNA then becomes the molecule associated with life, organic material. It does have soldiers made in it, but on the, right, on the left hand side we have the DNA molecule, the uh, molecule of life, and it's contrasted, well, basically inspired by DNA. And Dolly says that the DNA is the genetic persistence of human memory. So a very clever way to go back to his persistence of memory and use DNA to make it a Dollyanian thing. So it's the genetic persistence of human memory. And then it's contrasted with, on the right-hand side, the salt molecule. And I've been told by several people this doesn't look anything like a salt molecule. <laughs> Dolly said it's a salt molecule. We're going to go with Dolly. You know, he said he was very specific. And when you think of salt, you salt the field to kill everything. Salt is inorganic. It's crystal. So we have life, non-life. And right in the very center of the composition, oh, and another inspiration, Hans the Holbein, the dead Christ in the tomb is very much like one of the dead soldiers. And then we have the resurrection. And this is God the Father on the top. He's reaching down. He's pulling his son up to the heavens to bring life back to him. And Dali even points out that the muscles that he painted on the side of his arm are very much like the double helix structure. So he is very consciously trying to evoke that. Also, it's a little hard to see. I'm not sure if I have it in the next detail. Yeah. In the head of God the Father, and we're looking at him so that this is his nose. He's looking down at his son. This is his hair. So we're looking at the top of his head. But you can see, I think very clearly, there's an image of the Madonna, the Virgin Mary. And there's also an image of Christ in blessing. So he's consciously kind of weaving all these things together. And then finally, there's the prophet Isaiah. And the prophet Isaiah foretold the birth of Christ. Dolly paints him in the upper left-hand side with the banner that has that, uh, that title on it, the Galaxy Dolacy. And once again, inspired by another Renaissance master, inspired by Raphael. And that's going to be part of the Dolly and the Old Masters book that's coming, going to be published soon. Uh, Dolly said, um, as announced by the prophet Isaiah, the Savior contained in God's head, from which one sees for the first time in the iconography history, his arms repeating the molecular structure of Crick and Watson and lifting Christ's dead body so as to resuscitate him in heaven. So it's that idea of life, death, and rebirth. And then um, one last shot. This is Dolly in his studio with this particular canvas. It's finished. He's not working on it, but you can also see just the, the kind of context in which he was working. So three more canvases to go. We'll be relatively quick with Dead Brother. Dead Brother is one of those kind of core stories that Dolly finally deals with when he was 59 years old. So Dolly has a very unusual relationship with his brother, which I know, I think probably everybody here knows, but just in case you're not familiar with it, this work was first shown at Nodler, but it refers back to some key themes about Dolly's dead brother, um, image reproduction, Freud and Van Gogh. And the first thing is that before Dolly was born, there was another Salvador. The firstborn son to this couple, Dolly's parents, was named Salvador. He was Salvador Gallo Anselmo Dolly, and he died as a 22-month-old toddler from basically, um, you know, from uh, a cold, a really bad upper respiratory illness. Very typical in the early 1900s, not at all unusual. He had been named after his father, who was also Salvador, and when this couple lost their firstborn son, they had another son. And that's the artist we know as Salvador Dali. So named after the father the first time, they lost that firstborn son. They have another child born nine months and 11 days after the death of the first one. So almost immediately replaced him, had a boy, gave him that same first name. A lot of kind of bad juju, I guess, associated with that would be certainly Dali's take on it. And Dali said that uh, when he was young, his mother would warn him to wear a sweater or you'll catch a cold like your brother did. Is that a real memory? Is that a false memory? We don't know, but he talks about that in his autobiography. As a toddler, he wore the clothes of his brother. He would have played with the toys that were purchased for the brother. And as he grew up, he knew that there was a tomb in town with his name on it. So kind of some unusual and very disturbing associations. Dolly said that through the eccentricities I commit, 
I wish to prove that I am the living, I'm not the dead brother, but the living one. So he wants to be himself separate from whoever that first version of Salvador was. So some of the things happening in this work, there's this strange pattern. Looks very much like a cartoon that's been blown up. It's uh, basically a Bende dot pattern that was used in reproduction. But Dolly said that, uh, you know, well, before we say what Dolly said, it seems very much aligned with uh, Roy Lichtenstein. And this is a 1962 painting by Roy Lichtenstein done almost at the same period of time using Bende dots, very much looking like blown up cartoons. Dolly seems to have arrived at this simultaneously without the inspiration of uh, Lichtenstein. And he definitely had a very, very different idea about what he was doing with it. Doesn't seem like Dolly was copying Lichtenstein or that Lichtenstein was copying Dolly, but it was like a simultaneous idea. And for Dolly, these were actually cherries that were raining from the heavens. That's how he describes it. And he said that um, the bright cherries represent me, the living Dolly. The dark cherries represent my brother, the dead Salvador. And then he goes on to show dark cherries and light cherries connected as a, as a molecule so that he and his dolly are indelibly connected. And then there's also the two cherries on the same stem. So he and his brother are one entity. But he also talks about how his brother was a haunting apparition, something he had to regularly do battle with. And one of the images that doesn't immediately appear is there's a, actually a blackbird sort of hidden into the top forehead. And you can see it over here. Um, Dolly has a very complicated reference to Sigmund Freud and Freud's book on Leonardo da Vinci. But the main takeaway is that for Dolly, he says that this vulture represents his mother. And the reason that that becomes, and he calls her Lita. And in the story of Lita and the swan, Lita is a woman who's visited by um, a bird, by the swan, which is Zeus. Here's Leonardo da Vinci's version of that. The importance that Dolly weaves into this is that Lita was the mother of two twins, Castor and Pollux. One immortal, born of uh, Zeus, and one mortal, born of her husband, the king. And Dolly sees himself and his brother as Castor and Pollux. He hopes to be Castor, or I mean Pollux, the immortal one. The first version of Salvador was too volatile, too problematic, had to die in order for me to be the Salvador to live. And so this is kind of the story he weaves into this. And here's an earlier version lead in the swan Dolly had done, so he returns back to this. And he talks about this kind of maternal vulture that is represented by the, the bird above. There's also some strange references to guards and spacemen. These are these sort of conquistador, conquistadors at the bottom that seem to be helping Dolly drive away the, the threat of the apparition. Dolly says, every day I have to kill the image of my poor brother. I assassinate him regularly for the divine Dolly can have nothing in common with his former terrestrial being. So the haunting doppelganger needs to be done away with regularly. And then there's also the reference to Jean-Francois Millet. Um, the Angelus was an obsession of Dolly's in the 30s. By 1963, he's about to publish the, the tragic myth, which he found 30 years later. And it coincides with him starting to introduce Millet again into his paintings. Here we have a reference to the wheelbarrow. And the couple seems to be burying their child. That's Dolly's take on this. So the dead brother being buried here in the Malay painting. And finally, the last connection is this weird Van Gogh connection. Um, what does Van Gogh have to do with Dali and this painting? Well, surprisingly, Van Gogh also had a brother named Vincent who died before he was born, who he was named after, which is a pretty strange situation. It certainly would not have been unknown to Dali. And of course, we associate madness with Vincent Van Gogh. He cut off part of his ear, which brings us to the last detail of this painting, there seems to be an ear missing in Dolly's portrait of his brother. It seems to be blood instead of cherries. And the question is, is this a reference to Vincent van Gogh or is this just a coincidence? But certainly it's consistent with some of the other images that Dolly has done. And he mentions that in some of his writing about Vincent van Gogh's dead brother. So a possible connection. Two paintings to go. <laughs> Hallucinogenic Toreador, this is the deep dive of our collection, probably the heart and soul of what makes this collection great. It is um, a painting that was purchased by the Morses as soon as they knew they were about to open a museum and they bought it from Dolly's studio before it was shown. So it was like, we need that, that needs to be ours, here's the cash, definitely great. Fortunately, they bought it because it is a perfect summation of Dolly's career. It was first shown at Nodler before it was finished and then returned back to Spain when the Morses saw it, and that's when they bought it. 
It became the source of a book by Romero. The entire book is all of Dolly's life in one painting is how it's basically set up. And it was inspired by pencils. The simplest of all possible things. Dolly bought Venus pencils. He was looking at the Venus de Milo. He saw a double image. That became the opportunity for him to paint this very elaborate double image. Um, these are some more of the pencils. And ultimately, it became a very particular <coughs> face. So this is a book that Dolly owned by um, Barnaby Conrad about the death of Manalete, Spain's greatest bullfighter of the 20th century. And this is a photograph of Manalete who looks a lot like Adrian Brody. So that's, that's worth mentioning. Because then later, Adrian Brody plays him in the movie Manalete, The Death of Manalete. And he was gored to death in his prime in a bullfight. Also, Dolly's very dear friend, very, very close confidant who died at the hands of uh, Franco's forces, Federico Garcia Lorca, had written about a Spanish bullfighter gored to death in his prime. And one of the references is to the five o'clock in the afternoon when he was gored to death, when he died. So there's this passage at five in the afternoon. It was exactly at five in the afternoon. This is the poetry of Lorca. And you can see that Dolly has consciously painted a number five on the side of this Venus's face. But here's the face that Dolly saw. And this is the study for it, which is owned by the foundation, which became the source of, uh, of inspiration for our painting. You can see the face more clearly. It looks a lot like Manalete. This is a, an image from a stamp, a Spanish stamp, but you can see the similarity. And there you can see the face of ours next to it with the, the headdress up above. And the semicircle is the bull ring as well as the hat decorated by the flies. But the second, um, so we've, we see the first face. There's also a hidden image of a second bullfighter. The one that is surrounded in this halo of yellow the shape of that yellow halo is exactly the same as the shape of the Venus de Milo. So you can see clearly a Venus de Milo here. If you just look at the yellow outline here, it's an exact copy. It's another Venus. And at the very bottom, there's three more white Venuses. If you look at the black shadow, it's exactly the shadow of the bullfighter lifting up his cape. So Dolly finds a full face within the Venus de Milo, and then he finds a silhouette of a full body of a bullfighter in that same Venus. So this is really Dolly working overtime to impress. He wants to impress. It took him 16 months to do this. He wanted to do it right, and he wanted to astound. You know, this was the last major project he did before focusing on his museum in Spain. And some of the themes that come out, um, unrequited love. Venus is the, the perfection of female beauty in Western culture. She represents the feminine. The masculine bullfighter, the machismo bullfighter of Manalete represents the male. And we know that this is a tragedy. He will die. She has no arms. She can't protect him, intercede in any way. There's a sense of unrequited love. It's a romance that's going to go astray. And then Dolly paints himself and his wife. And at the time Dolly painted this, his wife was living in a castle that he had decorated and purchased for her. He could only visit her with a written invitation. So there's a very difficult situation that seems to be played out here of unrequited love between the two of them as well. Um, then we have some of the details. So the bull and the miracle of the flies are connected. This that looks initially like rocks from Captain Creus, the kind of rocks that inspired Dolly, but clearly it's a bull shape. You can see the two horns very clearly. Instead of blood, there's the body of water. This is the photo of the bull that actually gored Manalete in the book by um, Carnaby, Barnaby Conrad. And when you flip it, it's exactly the same as Dolly's image. So Dolly is copying specifically from the photograph to make sure we don't miss the connection. And then in the eye, where we expect to see a, an eye of a bull, there's actually one of these gadflies. And we just mentioned about the gadflies a moment ago associated with cattle and culture. So they're, they're transforming from the painting. They refer back to the, the reference of the miracle of the flies. What's interesting is around the time Dolly painted this, there was a club med opened up along the coast and this very important landscape that Dolly drew all of his inspiration from. Suddenly there was like this infusion of tourists that had taken over this area that he saw as kind of somewhat sacred. The joke here is that Dolly's, and you can see there's a woman on a raft representing the tourists, he's trying to invoke the miracle of the flies one more time to drive away the invaders. You know, it's, it's a very local joke. It's like nobody would get that unless he had written about this, but it's definitely a part of Dolly's inspiration for the painting. 
And the good thing is, even though Dolly didn't get to see it, this area was later purchased by the Spanish government, and it's now a Spanish park. So it's a state park. But at the time, Dolly saw this as an infusion of you know, tourists. The other question, and this was suggested by one of our docents, um, could this painting be seen from a fly's point of view? Is the reason we're hallucinating all these Venuses because a fly has a multifaceted eye, which would see multiple versions of exactly the same thing. And in the painting, there's actually 31 Venuses. They're not all easy to find, but this is the detail about where they all are, which I'm not gonna go into. There's a lot of Venuses. It's a very, you know, interesting proposition, the idea that this is from a fly's perspective. Some of the other things which we can go through quickly, the colored dots on the one side are probably the coat of lights that a bearable fighter wears into the ring, but it's also possible that it's the bandoleras which were placed into the bull. There's also references to Spain in relation to Cubism and um, Catalan uh, culture because we have a reference to Juan Gris, one of the fathers of uh, modern painting who was Spanish. We also have a reference to this particular Venus. You can see the second Venus right here, the headless one, is from Ampurias, where Dolly was born. So it's almost like he's arguing, again, in a kind of propagandistic way, that the place where he was born was the seat of modern art and the seat of the great antiquity as well. You know, so it's inevitable that Dolly would come forward. And they're also, if you can't see them, it's kind of interesting. And within the dots, they're hidden again, the same two bullfight or the two Venuses. And then Dolly uses it as an opportunity to remind you of all the things he had done. So there's a reference to an earlier double image of Voltaire in the, the red cloth. There's a reference to an earlier portrait of himself in the small detail of himself at the bottom. There is a reference to all of his figures with holes in the bodies because when the Venus turns away, she looks like Michelangelo's David with a hole in his body. There's also a reference to the Angelus because the shadows are the female Angelus figure underneath all of these. And finally, there's the rose that's thrown to the bullfighter, also referencing different periods where Dolly had used roses in his career. And then the final illusion in the painting, the one that's really a nice way to kind of conclude this painting, at the very bottom, it looks like there's a pattern created by light going through water, which actually turns out to be a reference to a Life magazine photo. This is a photo of a Dalmatian in a spotted room. And it was like a guessing game. It's called miscellany hidden image, you know, sight for sharp eyes. So in this, Dolly saw the Dalmatian, he copies it right into his painting. So he loved the idea of visual guessing games and illusions, and he also references even the earlier catechist painting by painting the dog in that exact spot. Couple nice end. The last reference is the Andalusian dog. You know, his good friend Lorca was from Andalusia. When Dolly made the really shocking movie back in 1929, he called it the Andalusian dog, sort of a slap in the face to his former friend and colleague here it seems to be a reference to his missing, his colleague. And then the final painting, Lincoln. It's the painting that was painted after Reynolds Morse wrote his book about the masterworks, painted in 1976. When Morse first saw it, he thought, not as great as the other ones, eh, not really a masterwork. But over time, I think everybody else has seen this as like Dolly's last hurrah, the great final painting in this series. And it was first shown at uh, the Guggenheim Museum for the Bicentennial, which is kind of cool. And the key themes here really include optical illusion, America, and the passing of time. And it was painted when Dolly was 72, 72 years old. He was a grand master who had outlived most, if not all, of his colleagues. He was definitely at the end of his career, but he had one great source of inspiration, one final one that he knew he had to take forward. And it was an article about recognition of faces. So in Scientific American, there was an article that basically was talking about the fact that our brain fills in a lot of missing information very quickly. We could not function in the world if our brain didn't quickly tell us that that's Fred and that's Julie, and I don't have to look at them for a long time to know exactly who everybody is. We know this is uh, you know, Jefferson. We don't have a lot of detail there. It's really distorted, but it's clearly Jefferson to us. We fill in the blank. It's the Mona Lisa. And the article was basically saying that this is how the mind works. Dolly had been exploring double images his whole career. This was just this perfect opportunity to think about this a little further. He saw this particular distortion of Abraham Lincoln's face, which is really abstract, and yet we can clearly see Abraham Lincoln right away. He thought, that's fascinating, but I can go one step further. 
I can make a completely different composition and it will work exactly the same way. It will be a painting and it will also be Lincoln. And so that's what we see here. We see an image that's both Dolly's wife in a window and the image of Abraham Lincoln. He even makes sure that we don't miss that by gluing the original photo <laughs> into his composition. You know, it's like there's not a lot of subtlety here. It's like Dolly wants you to get what he's trying to do. And the thing that had just happened, he's 72, he's just opened his own museum in Spain. In a way, he summarized his whole career. What else is he going to do? He is at the end of his career. He's outlived his colleagues. He's starting to get frail, but he has this one great idea. He needs to move forward with it. But the theme seems to be haunted constantly by the passing of time. So the first thing is that Gala is placed at the window very much like his sister was placed in the window in 1925. It's very much a similar painting. But the important thing is Gala was 82. So this is like time past the erotic impulse which seems to be waning in the, the later years of Dolly's life. So she's clearly seen at an earlier time. We see an image of Christ. The sun actually has become an image of Christ moving on into the next realm. He's been crucified and he's no longer here on earth. So that's another reference to the passing of time. And there's also you know, reference to just death itself and the crucifixion. There's also Abraham Lincoln, a kind of father figure and not just a father figure first president, but the first president assassinated in office. That seems to haunt the composition. And the final thing is that the title of it also references Mark Rothko. It's an homage to Mark Rothko. He was a colleague of Dali's. He was a year older than him. He was from Latvia. He had actually um, painted these large, again, very, very large canvases that have this seek the sublime through the abstract, through veils of color. Dali argued that each of his small tiles in his painting was like a reference to Rothko. Rothko had taken his life a few years before by slashing his wrists and taking barbiturates. He committed suicide. So the reference to him is not just to the way his works look, but also seems to be haunted by you know, a very sad uh, end of his career. The last thing about this work, which is really fun, is that Dali painted two versions of it. The first version is in his museum in Spain. It was painted after it opened. It was a little bit too big, and it was also painted on a photograph. So it was a photograph blown up and then painted on top of. He wanted to do it properly, and he wanted to do it slightly smaller, so you didn't need the sheer distance to recognize the illusion. So this is him in the St. Regis Hotel painting the canvas, which is certainly kind of more modest in scale compared to like the Columbus. But still, you couldn't get the right distance to see the illusion Dolly was painting. So he actually had a pair of binoculars available. When the Morses visited, as with anybody else, he had them look through the wrong end of the lens. And immediately, you see the image of Lincoln. It's pretty ingenious. So it's all about visual illusion. It's about astounding people. And the last words is to say that you know, the Morses started their collection, and then they really started to collect a variety of things. It was only when they had a museum that they knew they were going to open that they were able to purchase some of the larger canvases. They purchased and collected five of these large canvases. Since the museum opened down here in St. Pete, we've collected three more. And I think we can just be very you know, fortunate and glad that we have so many examples of this really vital work that Dolly was doing as a kind of ambitious project throughout the last 20 years of his career. So hopefully through the course of today, you've learned a little bit more about Dolly and these paintings. And uh, thank you for your patience. So thank you.